please grab a seat. And good morning, everyone. Uh, please do uh, turn in your Bible uh, to uh, the reading that Sue read for us just before. It's 1 Samuel 9, and I've forgotten what page that is in the church Bibles. Can someone... 431. 431. 431. Well worth... Um, 430. Um, well worth having that open. Uh, we're, we're continuing this series that we began again last week uh, in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is narrative, it's story. And I think the, the best way to follow, us, follow it is with the story open in front of you. So please do have it uh, there uh, with you, 1 Samuel 9. There, there are outlines at the back as well if you find that helpful. Uh, when I say it's story, uh, Samuel is some of the best narrative uh, in history, really. Um, it is a gripping story and I do encourage you to be reading along with it uh, during the week, getting ready uh, for Sunday. But what's wonderful about it is that it is a true story. And it's the story of how God is at work fulfilling his promise to save us. And we're going to see today him at work in uh, what look like minute details. But we'll see, uh, as we've been thinking about already in our service this morning, how completely sovereign he is and how much we can trust him. So let me pray uh, that we would listen well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and it is the word of you, our King. And so we pray for, uh, well, not hearts that are um, blasé about the word that we will hear, but we know that, uh, well, it's the word of our King, and so we will listen with humility. We will listen knowing that you are sovereign. We will listen knowing that you are good. And so help us to listen well for our good and for your glory. Amen. Uh, here's a question. I, I seem to be being asked quite regularly in church leader circles. You can imagine how exciting those circles are. Um, what's your leadership strategy? Uh, what's your leadership strategy? I, it feels like um, I, I've been back in Sydney for about 10 years and that seems to be the most common question that I hear in various meetings or conferences or whatever that, that I attend. Uh, what, what's your strategy for leadership? How are you going to go about leading uh, the church? I could uh, fill the rest of my earthly days with podcasts, books and conferences advocating winning strategies uh, for how to lead. Um, and I think that plays out not just in, well, the exciting world of uh, church leader circles, but it plays out in almost any circle uh, you can imagine. It, it, it's true in nations, that constant question of leadership and whether it is good leadership. Uh, yes, in churches, but also in families, how we're leading in our families. Are we doing that well? Do we have the right plans? And even each of us as we try to lead in our own lives... And so here's my question for you. What, what sort of leadership do you think you need? Uh, what sort of strategies? Uh, what sort of leadership changes along the way? I, I wonder if you've noticed that uh, when there are calls for change in leadership at whatever level, whether it's national or, or more personal, it's when things have gone wrong in some way or things have got difficult and, and there's call for change. That's what's going to fix it. If we have a change of leader, everything will be better. Uh, I guess an example that we've seen uh, as a nation in recent times, the Reserve Bank fighting inflation, it's only got one tool in its kit bag and that's uh, raising interest rates and that's what it's been doing for the last uh, little while. Uh, we don't really like that plan, so maybe it's time for a new leader uh, with a different plan. I'm not making any economic comment there, but th that seems to be the solution. Uh, or church leadership again. Uh, you need to lead like those who lead well in the world. You need to be more of a CEO is uh, one of the comments that I hear quite regularly. To be honest, I feel less like a CEO, more like a, uh, a corner fish and chip shop owner. Uh, that's what it feels like uh, to lead a church. And so there's questions for, for church leaders, but I think there's questions for us personally as well. Uh, the whole rise of the concept of a life coach uh, who will lead us. And uh, my eldest daughter going through the HSC at the moment... Uh, a phrase I'd never heard of before this year, um, Year 12 students need an HSC mentor, uh, someone who has led, someone who has done it well. Uh, and I think that's true in almost any facet of our lives, whether it's for families, in parenting or in marriages. We look to those who look like they're head and shoulders above the rest, who, who are leading well and perhaps we need to mimic them. So this question of leadership is a dominant one for us at almost any level uh, of uh, our lives 
And it is the dominant question in 1 Samuel that I hope you have open there in front of you. Uh, 1 Samuel is all about leadership in God's people, Israel. And it's a genuine uh, question for them because if you were here last week or when last year when we looked at this, you'll, you'll remember how much danger God's people Israel are in at this point in their history. Um, if you've got the passage open there, have a look at 10 verse 5 and you'll see that God's enemies, the enemies of God's people, the Philistines, are camped on a hill right there amongst God's people. So it's not a theoretical problem that they're dealing with, it's a very real problem. And with that real problem in their sights, their leadership is under question. Uh, earlier in 1 Samuel, when we looked last year, we, we had Eli uh, leading God's people. Uh, and the problem was, is, as Eli grew old and the leadership was sort of being handed on to his sons, we were told in chapter 2, verse 12, that his sons were scoundrels, utter scoundrels, not the sort of leaders uh, that God's people needed. And so God provided them with another leader, Samuel. Um, and in chapter 8, uh, last week, we saw that Samuel is a strong leader. He is a godly leader, but here's his problem. He's getting very old. And so his leadership days are numbered and same problem again. His sons, we're told, are corrupt and don't walk in God's ways. And so what is God's people going to do? The crisis is real. The enemy is there, camped on the hill. How is Israel going to secure its future? And last week we saw their answer. Do you remember it? Let's go with what works elsewhere. We want a king like the nations. When we look around and we see the strong leadership of the nations around us, like the Philistines camped on this hill, we want a leader like that who can fight our battles, who can deal with our problems. And it does seem a reasonable strategy, doesn't it? Real problems met with real world solutions. And I suspect for us as well, it seems a reasonable strategy to approach life that way. Real world uh, problems in a church or in a family or whatever are met with real world solutions. But here's what we're going to see as we continue our way through 1 Samuel. We saw it last week and it's even more clear this week. It is a foolish strategy, a foolish strategy that only gets formulated when we forget there is still someone on the throne. There is a king already. The reality is if you read through the book of 1 Samuel, Eli was never the leader. He was never the king. He led at the command of the word of God. And Samuel, as strong and as godly and as wise as he was, was that because he led by the word of the Lord. But here's the Lord's take on Israel's new strategy that we saw last week in chapter 8. We want a king like the nations. What's behind that strategy? We'll have a look at, uh, if you've got the passage open there, flick back to chapter 8, verse 7. Here is God's estimation of that strategy. They have rejected me as their king. There is a king. There is a leader. It's not Samuel, it is the Lord, and they are rejecting him as their king at this moment. And so what will God do? Well, what follows in chapter 9 and onwards is an account of how God, who is our king and who is still king, will use even this foolish strategy to achieve his good plan for his people and for the world. And so I'm going to encourage you to listen well as he speaks of this plan in this passage. Here is a word that reveals, yes, that the Lord is still remaining on his throne, that he is sovereign, as we'll see, over the, the minute, mundane details of history and of our lives, as he is over the eternal realities as well. And it's a word that reveals that because he is faithful, he will not relinquish his throne, because he has made a promise, a promise to save us. And so really what we're going to do is look through the story together, have it open there in front of you, and it begins with this question. Now, here we have these massive issues for God's people Israel, uh, the enemy camped at the gates, and we zoom in on, well, what looks like a much smaller crisis, some lost donkeys. Have a look at verse 1. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish. Now, if you read through 1 Samuel, this looks like the start of a new chapter or even a new story. Right back at the start of chapter 1, we had a very similar line when we were introduced to Samuel. So here's a new story, but it doesn't look like a very interesting story, to be honest. Uh, here is a man from a, a nothing family. And as we read later in this passage, from the smallest tribe of Israel, he doesn't seem that significant. But let's read on. Verse 2. Kish had a son named Saul. 
as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel. And he was a head taller than anyone else. Now the pieces are starting to fall into place. Uh, You see what the name of Kish's son is? His name is Saul. And do you know what Saul means? Saul means asked for. Chapter 8, the people, God's people asked for a king. Well, here's Mr. Asked for. Uh, The pieces are starting to come together. And doesn't he look like he will fit the part well? He, he almost, the description of him in chapter 2 is he'd be, a, he'd be a likely contestant in something like The Bachelor. Uh, well, not really. As we'll see later, he is married and he has a son and we'll meet him in a few chapters' time. But he is heads and shoulders above any other candidate for king. He is the real deal. Back to the crisis at hand. The enemy of God is on the hill. Philistines are there. They want a king to deal with that. But now this other crisis crashes in. Do you see it there, verse 3? Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father Kish were lost. Now, do you see the sort of the jarring sort of juxtaposition? We've got this massive crisis in the nation and now we're zoomed in on the donkeys of Kish. Livelihood of Israel hangs in the balance and yet this is where our attention is. It does seem strange, but listen in. Because here we're seeing how the God of all creation is sovereign even in the details. And as we hear this search, do you see it begin in verse 4? Saul and uh, will a servant as well go in search for the donkey this potential king doesn't seem to have a clue what's happening up and down they go through different territories round and round they go it's all it's all a bit haphazard and wherever they turn there's no donkeys to be found or at least not Kish's donkeys but look where the path leads verse 5 they reach the district of Zuf now here is a hint of where this story is leading God's people think they need a king. Samuel is commanded by God to give them what they have asked for. Well, here, as these hapless searchers' path reaches Zuf, we need to ask, who the heck is Zuf and why are we here? Well, if you've got 1 Samuel open there, if you flick all the way back to chapter 1, verse 1, we were introduced to Zuf. Uh, Zuf is Samuel's great, great, great grandfather. Saul's haphazard path, up and down Dale, around the corner, all over the territory, uh, looking for these donkeys. Somehow, he has stumbled right into Samuel's hometown. Which, if you look at chapter 8, and this is intricate, but that's the way this story is written. At chapter 8, Samuel has sent everybody to their hometown, including himself. He's gone back to his hometown. This is where Samuel is. And the Lord's sovereign threads are, are, are being tied together here, and they're starting to show... He, is this what's happening? Has he led this hapless wanderer, Saul, in search of donkeys right here to where Samuel is? Well, as we ask that, it seems like the path is about to stop. You see there, verse 5, Saul, who's kind of sick, to be honest, of looking for the donkeys and a bit worried that his dad will be now more worried about him than the donkeys. He says, well, let's just turn back. This hasn't really worked out. And at this point, further threads start to appear. The potential king, Saul, isn't leading this search at all. Now his servant is the one who takes charge. Do you see it there, verse 6? But the servant replied, Look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected and everything he says comes true. You see what's starting to happen in this path of this story? This, the search for donkeys is shifting into a search now for God's word to shed some sort of light on this path that they're walking. And have a look closely at verse 6. Do you see what Saul's servant hoped this man of God might help them with? It's, it's not so much about where the donkeys are at that he's interested in asking. More literally, what verse 6 says, the, the servant says, that this man of God might tell us the path that we have stumbled onto. What is this path that we're on? There is a sense that the path they're on, it seems bigger to the servant than than just their plans to find the donkeys. And there is an author to this story. And his name is the Lord and he is leading them on this path. And so they go to the man of God to seek answers about this path. It'll become even more obvious in a moment. And I want to say at this point, this is of course true of our own lives as well. And yet we forget. Uh, We presume, even though we've sung earlier um, in uh, our service that we are not the boss, we presume in our lives we are writing an autobiography. We presume in our lives that we are setting the course uh, ahead. We grasp at self-rule. We we think we're in charge of these things. Uh, 
but the path we walk is actually led by another. Now, this is how Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 puts it. In our hearts we plan our path, but the Lord establishes our steps. Each moment, actually, of our lives is, is weighted with that sort of significance, that there is a king still on the throne, although we forget it. That we walk a path in this life where God is involved, and he's not just involved as a side part, he's the king. It's true of the mundane moments that are ahead of you this week. It's true of the sort of the mountaintop days that we have in life that are just great. It's true of the valley floor moments that, where we can't see the, the, the rhyme or reason to the path. Well, how can we see a, a design and a plan in, in the path that, that our lives lead? How, how can we see God's plan in it? Is it guesswork? No. Read on and we'll, we'll see how we can make sense of, well, even the path of our own life, let alone the path we see for God's people here. Verse 9, Saul and the servants seek out the seer, the man of God. And do, do you see verse 9? It's like a little uh, hint from the narrator to help us to work out why they're seeking out the man of God. It's because people would do this to inquire of God. They want to hear God's word on something. And in this case, they want to hear God's word about their path. Making sense of history's path in the end doesn't come from introspection for us as humans, looking into ourselves, trying to understand it. And it, it, it doesn't even come from retrospection, sort of looking back on our lives and being able to understand the path from our viewpoint. That's not how we understand the path. It comes from seeking the word of the king of the path, who sovereignly sets our steps. And so let's see that as we go back to the story. Listen for that word. Verse 11... As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some young women coming out to draw water and they asked them, is the seer here? Now, uh, again, uh, God is brilliantly sewing together the details here. It's, it's a strangely familiar Bible scene. It, it seems that significant moments in God's plan seem to occur around uh, this domestic scene of women gathering water. You, you see it in the life of Isaac in the Old Testament, of Jacob and, of course, Moses. And perhaps most familiar to us is the woman at the well in, in John chapter 4, uh, just going, hopefully, to be not intersect with anybody in the middle of the day, and yet she meets Jesus and uh, says of him, come meet the man who told me everything I did. Could this be the one who makes sense of the path? Well, will this moment also be significant for Saul? Well, let's have a look. The timing of it all seems very significant. Have a look at their arrival in Zorf. Everything about the timing is weighted. Look carefully at verses 12 and 13. Look at all the temporal markers that are there to sort of raise the urgency of this moment. Uh, they're looking for the seer, the man of God, and this is what the women gathering water say. He's just ahead of you. Hurry now. He comes today. Find him before he goes. Find him immediately. Do you, do you see the urgency in this? Uh, a couple of reflections as I was reading this this week about these urgent timing markers that are here very deliberately. First, uh, remember what they're doing. They're seeking out the word of God. And I think there's something in that for us as well. While it does seem that our life for us often ebbs and flows, there does come time and urgency to listen to God and to actually understand his plans for us. Reminds me of the words we hear in Hebrews. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Listen, it's urgent. But here's the other reflection on these timing markers. I, I am struck by these, this reference to just at the right time. Here they are. And, and again, you see how God does that. The Bible reveals that God sets fitting times for things in his plans. Uh, the start of Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 14, as Jesus steps onto the st scene of human history, he says, the time has come. The king is here. And of course, we read in Romans chapter 5 of our own salvation, it is just at the right time that Christ saved us. I'm struck that here at this fitting time for this potential king, the activity that is happening is, well, do you see it there, verse 13? It's a sacrifice is what's happening in this moment. Why? Well, consider the events of chapter 8. Remember what happened in chapter 8? This fearful and sinful rejection of God as king, this demand for a king like the nations. Everyone is sent home 
God promises to provide a king, but why the delay? Well, what we do know is that God is not ignoring their request. He has said he will give them a king, but here's what he's also not doing. He's not ignoring the sin of their rejection either. In fact, what Samuel has been doing, it seems, is in between that moment in chapter 8 to this moment when he and Saul intersect here, is that he's been travelling to the homelands of the different tribes of Israel where the people have been sent and he's been leading in sacrifice for the sin of their rejection of God as king. And now that circuit, if you like, has has reached fulfilment as he now comes to his own hometown to lead a sacrifice there, which is when Saul steps in. And I am struck that at just the time for the sacrifice, this king steps into the sea and finds himself, if you read on as we heard it read earlier, he finds himself sort of thrust into the spotlight at this moment, even though he doesn't really know what's going on. Verse, verse 19, we're told he's invited to a special meal and uh, it's a meal connected to the sacrifice and he's going to be the guest of honour at the meal. Elaborate preparations are made for this uh, bewildered guest of honour. Why the sacrifice? Why the king? What is God up to? What is the path that we have stumbled onto here? And again, introspection or retrospection is not going to help us understand. God's word is what's needed. And that's what we hear next. Firstly, God's word to Samuel about Saul. Have a look at verse 15. What's so brilliant about this verse is we've been watching these threads come together is that we can stop the guesswork of introspection or retrospection. Uh, Here's revelation. Why is Saul here? Well, verse 15. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people, Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people for their cry has reached me. Why is Saul here? Well, look carefully at verse 16. Three things to, to, to notice. Firstly, the Lord sent Saul to Samuel so that Samuel can anoint him as ruler, as he promised he would in chapter 8. The people asked for a king. Well, here, stepping onto the scene, is a man called asked for. Question. Does this mean that God's people are in charge now? They're calling the shots. They demanded a king. God has provided them a king. Is he now just going at their, at their demands? Uh, well, keep listening. Let God's word unveil the path. Here's the second thing to notice. The people ask for a king, but listen to the word God uses for the king he provides. Literally, he is a ruler, or even more literally, a prince for my people. Do you see what's happening? Despite Israel's evil rejection of the Lord, he is still on the throne. He is not relinquishing it. This man is a prince under the king. And of the people, do you see what he says of them? They are my people. They are not their own. They are not like the nations. They are, if you look forward to chapter 10, verse 1, they are my precious inheritance. Here's the third thing to notice. The Lord has sent them this leader, this prince, to fight their battles as they have asked, but not because they demanded a rescuer, but do you see why he sent it? Verse 16, it is because the Lord heard their cry for help. The Lord sees their need. Why does the Lord respond to this the need of this sinful people, especially if, if you remember uh, back last week in chapter 8, verse 18, he warned them of a day coming when he would not listen to their cry. And yet he's doing it here. Why? Why does he hear their cry? Well, here's why. And it's not to do with them. It's to do with what he has already done. He has made a promise. A promise to rescue his people. A a promise to save his people. It's a promise actually sown in all the way through his word to his people, Israel. It's a promise that's, that's resting on and secured by two wonderful realities. And neither of them are about the people. Firstly, it's because the Lord is sovereign. He writes the story. And secondly, because the Lord is gracious. He writes stories we don't deserve. And if we want assurance of that, and this is where we'll uh, finish our journey through this story, see the signs that are given to Israel's new leader, Saul, in the opening verses of chapter 10. Here is God's word to Saul from Samuel. Three signs, and they're all pointing to God's sovereign and gracious promise to save. 
Have a look briefly at them with me. Have a look, verse 1, here's the first sign. Uh, Saul is anointed uh, to become the leader by Samuel and then he's sent on his way and he says, as you go, here's three things you're going to see on your journey home. The first is this, uh, the Lord points to Rachel's tomb. He's going to walk past Rachel's tomb. Why is that significant? Well, it's a flashback, actually, to Israel's origins as God's people, how they even became his people. When Rachel died, actually giving birth to Benjamin, the, the tribe that Saul would come from. And you can read about that in Genesis 35, if you want to look at it this week in small group. Uh, here is a sign that God is pointing to as, as this king comes onto the scene that says God saves his people by grace alone. As it was in the beginning, with Rachel, so it is. Even at this moment. Here's the second sign. Have a look at verses 3 and 4. The Lord points now to the, what we're told here is the great tree of Tabor. And again, he's pointing back to his old promise. This is why he's doing all of this. Uh, this oak tree is actually near a place called Bethel. And that was a place of Jacob's incredible encounter with, with God when, when this same promise was repeated to Jacob. And, and not only uh, this promise of rescue and blessing for God's people, but what's so amazing about the promise there, and you can read about this if you're taking notes in Genesis 28 verse 14, it's not just a promise for Israel, it's a promise for all nations. Here is why God is giving them this king. And here's the third and final sign, and it's perhaps the most remarkable the final sign, as Saul's journey reaches Gibeah, almost in his hometown, back where the journey started for him in the search for the donkeys. Gibeah of God, as it's described here, means hill of God. And here is, at this point, is where the current crisis crashes into the scene. Here at the third signpost, if you like, to prove that God is faithful to his promises, here we are told that there is an enemy on the hill of God camp there on the hill of God. They are the very problem that Saul has been anointed to deal with. And so what will God do as he reaches this third signpost and he sees the enemy there camped on the hill? Well, verse 6, we are told God will send his spirit, the spirit of the Lord, powerfully on Saul and he will turn Saul into another man. What sort of man? Well, the man who can lead them as rescuer. And verse 7, he is to extend his hand to that very cause as he leads them. Now, after winning the battle, the final thing we're told in our passage is this new leader is instructed to go to a place called Gilgal. Even that is significant. Uh, a place named after another moment of God's rescue. As in Joshua chapter 5, Gilgal, which is this place that uh, Saul is now to go to, it, it basically is named that because it, it reminds the people that God rolled away their enemies, Egypt. We're left to ask, what mighty enemy will this king roll away? And as we finish, I, I want to remind you of the privilege of the viewpoint you have as those who stand on the other side of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need not guess about how God's unfolding plan that we're seeing revealed again here uh, is going to play out. His word has revealed it to us. The reality is, and we'll see this in the coming chapters as we look at the, the, the leadership of King Saul, he will turn out only to be a sign of this promise fulfillment. The Spirit will come on him, as is promised here, but ultimately, do you know what he will do in defeating God's enemies? Nothing. Nothing. It will be tragic. And the reason is, he will not listen to the Lord who is king. And even his successor, as we'll read in the coming chapters, Israel's greatest king, David, will, will fail to roll away their enemies. These men are, are just signposts to help us to see the king that finally did come at just the right time. Do you know what Mark chapter 1, 11 says? As Jesus began his mission, as, as he began his mission as our rescuer, the spirit of the Lord came on him at his baptism. But it wasn't there to turn him into another man, as we see with Saul. It was to confirm the man he is. He is God's son. He is sent to save us. A king who comes at just the right time when we were powerless before our own sin and death, he came. It's the king, Jesus, who reveals to us just how gracious and faithful God is to his promise to save that we've seen in these signs, despite our rejection of him. You know, this evil request of um, uh, God's people in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8 is actually going to be tragically repeated in the life of Jesus. Jesus, who is arrested and on trial before Pilate in John chapter 29, as, as Pilate uh, orders his beating, 
uh, to almost uh, on the edge of on the edge of death, and then parades him before Israel, his people, and he says, "Behold your king." Mocking him. The most tragic moment of that scene is not the the treatment that Pilate meters out to Jesus. It is their response, as he says, "Here is your king." Do you know what God's people respond with? We have no king but Caesar. We want a king like the nations. What a devastating moment. Now, of course, none of that thwarts the Lord's sovereign and gracious promise of old. Later that same day, that king will walk up the hill of God where our enemy is camped and he will be lifted high as king at just the right time. 1 Samuel 9, this is a story of the king the people asked for. His name was Saul, which means asked for. And we know how that plays out. But behold, the king God actually sends. His name means, Jesus means God saves. And we know how that plays out. After the victory of the cross, we find Jesus with the rolled away stone, Gilgal. For he has rolled away our last and greatest enemy, death. And so I simply want to encourage you as we look at these chapters together to behold your king. This story is not ultimately about us and uh, applications we can make in our own lives. It is about seeing the one who is still on his throne, who is faithful and gracious in refusing to relinquish that throne because he has made a promise to Israel and to all nations to save and only he is strong to deliver. Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you are king And we thank you that you are a good king, but you're a mighty king. And so we can trust you. And we pray, Father, as we see you sovereignly at work in the details here, we know that is true in our own lives. And we know that you have made a way to save us. We praise you for this. In Jesus' name. Amen.